Good evening. I am so pleased to be sharing London Letters Home of Gus Farley Jr. It's a Proverse Prize publication coming out of Hong Kong. Uh, Gus Farley Jr. was my great grandfather and he ended up going to London to study as a tea taster during the Civil War when he was, he went off when he was 17 with the aim of going on to China and joining his first cousins in their business out in China as tea importers. Gus was not even on my radar, here he is in Japan, but my grandfather was born in Japan and that I did know. And once when I was in London, I was standing in the breakfast line at a youth hostel and Satsuki Yamashita was behind me and I shared with her that my grandfather had been born in Japan in 1880. And she got so excited when she went home, she sent back pictures of the um, Yokohama and she had found out at the archive where his office was. And she also sent back a, a picture of his tea label. And you could see Fraser, Farley and Varnum from Yokohama. And it is Mikado Chop was the name of the Japan tea that they imported. And so I thought that that was just fabulous. And then I found out that my cousin Rob had over 90 letters that Gus had written back during his teenage years in London. And I started to read the letters and I got really excited. The 150 years between us evaporated and I transcribed the letters. And then I had to find out what all the references were um, about. So I just had a lot of fun chasing those down. And then my another cousin was downsizing and she just recently sent me this wonderful picture of Gus from when he was about 18, taken in London, because otherwise I just had pictures of him being old and pictures of him being young. But here he is as a young man writing the letters and he was writing to his parents. Here is his father, Gus Farley Sr. He was a leather broker in Boston and his mother, Amelia Frederica Newman, was Swedish. She had immigrated all by herself when she was 10 in 1832, been adopted by a sea captain and his wife in Ipswich. And this is a picture of Gus in 1854, a little miniature with three of his sisters. We have Carrie, Eunice, and Lizzie. And when he is writing, there is another five-year-old Delia who is the recipient of some of his letters. Now, folks in those days used to talk a great deal about going to sea, is what Eunice wrote when she was writing an essay about Gus, as they lived near the sea and saw ships and sailors. And indeed, this is the shakedown voyage of Gus's father. In 1828, he wrote this ridiculous composition, not fit to be seen, for his Bradford Academy um, essay. And he wrote a voyage... There we go. A voyage to St. Thomas. And I and the uh, the the pictures of the people blank blanket. I was going to read it over. But um, on the 25th of March in 1828, they left Boston and they sailed out the way. So though Gus was not a sailor, he might have been intrigued by international trade. And these are images that are from Winslow Homer in, in uh, um, Gloucester and Massachusetts, and, and this little poem, I think, might give an idea of what, what the uh, young men were thinking about. This is a poem that was written in 1900 by a, man, uh, a Marblehead fellow. The old clipper days were jolly when we sailed the seven seas, and the house flags of our merchant ships were whipped by every breeze. It was goodbye to your mother and the pretty girls on shore, for we're off around the howling horn bound down to Singapore. We romped the rushing trade winds and we raced the big monsoon. We carried reeling royals from Manila to Rangoon. We were chased by Malay pirates from Natura to Penang, and we drove her scuppers under to outsail the cutthroat gang. Now, Gus finished high school, and when he had turned 17 on the 4th of July in 1861, and of course, the Civil War was gaining momentum. And I do believe that his family hustled him out of the country at that point. Uh, he was the eldest uh, son in the family, indeed the only son, and in the days before Social Security and even before penicillin and everything, he had a very important place in the family, and if his, anything happened to his father, the um, 
being the breadwinner for the family, would come down to him. And indeed, once he got to London, he wrote, there is not a day passes, but I congratulate myself on not being a soldier, as I very probably should be if I were at home. The horrors of the war are certainly awful. And as you know, that the war was on land and it was also on sea. And he was very worried most of the time he was in London that he would be cut off from his family by the war on the Atlantic. So he accepted an offer from his cousins to go work in their firm in China. And here they are. There is Albert and George and John and Augustine. And here are the parents. Um, George Hurd and Elizabeth Hurd is behind your names. Um, these, this this uh, photograph was in 1875, but still the Band of Brothers was quite a bit older than Gus. They were 27 to 20 years older than him, but they then definitely welcomed him into their business and took him under their wing. They found a mentor for him in London and they uh, organized his, his apprenticeship there. Now, the firm that he was going to work for was Augustin Hurd and Company, which had been established in 1841 by their uncle, Augustin Hurd. Now, Augustin Hurd over here was a great sailor. In 1800, when he was 15, he went to sea first as a supercargo and then as a captain. He sailed the seven seas and made a great fortune. And then he retired to Boston. And for some reason, when he turned uh, 56, he decided to go to China and open a tea trading company. So he took his, um, he took John over here and he went as a young, young man at 19 out to, out to China or Ganzhou and began trading. And here is uh, Gus, here is the, the settlement in Canton going up in fire because Gus during those years heard many stories about Augustine Hurd and the tea trade. It was very volatile when they went out there in the 1840s. The business was based on two different commodities. Tea was coming out and they were um, smuggling in opium to the Chinese people. When the settlement in Canton went up in flames, they had half a million dollars worth of gold bullion on hand. And the story was very dramatic about schlepping the gold bullion out of the burning buildings and into the sampans to save as much as they could. And there were other exciting adventures. So where was Gus going? By the time that Gus came on board, the firm had moved away from Canton. They'd moved to Hong Kong and they bought this building here. And this is their residence and offices. They probably had warehouses down on the shore. And it was a very exotic expat life with French chefs and champagne, and probably like living in your own gentleman's club. Um, it was a very lucrative business, the tea business. And when Gus was in London, he found out the first place that he worked, the, uh, the business had over a hundred thousand pounds in their bank account, which would be about 13 million pounds, which was a great deal for a firm that only had seven employees. And then another firm that he worked at, did his apprenticeship at, uh, they were making three to 400 pounds over expenses during the busy tea season, which would have been the summer and the fall. But more to the point, Gus met a young man who was under 30 and he'd been seven years in China and he'd made 30,000 pounds for himself. So what is the tea trade? So the China trade is based on the Camellia sinensis and green tea and black tea come from the same plant. The Chinese tea has many different kinds of tea. So it was important to taste the tea before you bought it. And here you can see in China, this is a Westerner and he is tasting the different teas that he might consider buying. And you can see he has a silver spoon in which he tastes the tea so that other people can taste the tea. And then just like uh, wine tasting, you, you spit into a spittoon because you can't just keep imbibing that much tea without getting a little bit whippy. And this wonderful image from the um, Peabody Essex Museum shows the whole tea business in one go. Up here at the top, they are harrowing a field. Here they are planting the field with the tea bushes. The tea tree or tea tea bush, they kept them as bushes to make them easier to pluck. And they are being tended here. 
in this field, they are being plucked. And then there's going to be some processing because you can't send the very green tea leaves uh, packed all over to Europe because they will mold on the way. And you can see little fires underneath these basins that these men have. They probably have about five pounds of tea in a wicker basket, which they are heating over the fires. The longer it um, heats, the blacker the tea gets. And then coming down here, you can see a wall that the Chinese put up to keep the Westerners from infiltrating into interior of uh, China. Now, these are the go-downs or the warehouses of the Westerners, and there they are with their top hats and boots on. Uh, these fellows here are tamping the tea down in the boxes. They're wearing special spiky shoes to get the boxes tamped down really tightly. The lids are getting nailed on. Records are being kept of the different lots and weights of the chests. Here they are being weighed. And over here, you see two fellows are carrying out a chest to this sampam. And the reason you would need two people to carry it is each chest weighed about 100 pounds. Now, um, I don't know if you can see through your names or not, but uh, they would get the, the uh, they would come on board the sampam and then they would go seven miles out the, um, the Pearl River to where the Chinese allowed the Westerners to anchor their boats. The boats would be loaded with the cargo as they were at anchor, and then they would sail off around the Horn. And this is a map showing the shipping routes before 1800. Before 1800, the East Indiamen took 18 to 24 months to bring the tea to England. By the 1830s, the Clippers had shortened the voyage to three months. And of course, in 1869, the Suez Canal right over here went in and steamers shortened the trip even more. So in September, Gus applied for his passport. And here you can see over here, Gustavus Farley Jr., age 17, height five feet, five and a half inches tall. So he wasn't really a large, robust fellow, but, but a modest height. And he was going to Europe. When he did get to Europe, he weighed himself on the scales at the docks and he weighed 129 pounds when he first got there. And he traveled with his cousin, George Hurd, and they traveled, he's just seven years older than Gus, he's the youngest of the cousins. And they traveled on the SS Arago, a French steamer. And Gus wrote, I must not think of going home for a long time because with the war on the, um, on the Atlantic going on, and then not having very much money because his father never made much money and his apprenticeship was going to be unpaid. So he figured that he would just be going straight out to China after he finished his apprenticeship. And they sailed from New York. This surprised me, but it did. But we got a chance to see another harbor. And so here is Battery Park. Broadway goes right up the spine of Manhattan. There's Central Park. Grace Church is in here. Wall Street is here, and this is South Street. And South Street is where all the clipper ships came in with their bowsprits coming right across the, 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 um, the road. Gus would have an office at 64 South Street when he left uh, Japan and came to work in New York. On the Hudson River side is where the steamers seem to come in. And then we get them off. Uh, Gus wrote a very nice first letter all about his trip two across the Atlantic. And interestingly, uh, he wrote, we arrived off Cape Race, Newfoundland, about half past one at night. And on firing a gun, a boat came off from the lighthouse and we received some dispatch and received some dispatches because Cape Race was the last place that the telegraph was in North America. And in those days, if you wanted to have your last word sort of in real time, with your beloved or your business partners, um, that was the place to go. It, the, the steamer is right over here, and here's the ship coming out, the, the rowboat coming out to get the dispatches from the lighthouse. And Gus's adventure almost ended in disaster. Um, the SS Arago came around the English Channel because it was on its way to France, came up the Solent and anchored right off Cowes. They were going to, Gus was going to Southampton, which is up this uh, way here. Um, they, they sent up flares to get the tug, tug to um, tug like this to get the, the mail and the passengers that were going to England on board. 
And while they were waiting, it was the middle of the night, a dense fog set in. A regular tender had started for us, but had burst her boiler, and a dingy one came in her stead. We transferred to her, only to find that her captain was drunk. We were going along very quietly when we heard cries of port, port. A very large steamer was coming down upon us at full speed. The man at the helm jammed the wheel over, and a very large steamer just grazed past us. I assure you, I and all on board thought our hour had come. After this excitement, the captain became bewildered, and after running the vessel aground twice, we made the pier about four o'clock this morning. Then Gus took the train up to London, and here he arrived. He arrived, um, London is a port city on the River Thames. It had a population at the time of three million people. It was the heart of Queen Victoria's empire. So there were um, mounted soldiers, there were aristocrats, there were queens, there was the Lord Mayor. It was many, many things that were not in Boston. To orient you, here is the river snaking through the town, Houses of Parliament, Buckingham Palace, St. Paul's Cathedral, uh, Tower of London is over here. And when Gus first got there, he had a boarding house on this side of the river, walked across London Bridge. And then later on, he got better air and got to be up here near Paddington Station for several boarding houses. And this is where he was live, leaving. I thought since we've seen New York Harbor, it's fun to see Boston Harbor. And it is also a deep water harbor like New York, and the boats can come right up to the docks and unload their cargo right there. And it, but it had a population of 200,000, and his father's office was right down there on the waterfront where he was a leather broker. The leather was for the shoe industry. There were many factories that were starting up at the time for making shoes, and New England was a big shoe-making industry. So when he got to London, it was in the throes of the Victorian Revolution, and the steam power had made huge difference. Here they are digging a trench through the middle of the city to put in the Metropolitan Underground Railway. It was the first of its kind. It sort of went above ground, below ground, above ground, and below ground, but there were seven different stations, and I think it was several miles long, and it sped up. Gus's commute in London incredibly as opposed to, to walking. The other innovations that were happening besides the steamboats and the steam trains, the canal systems were stretching all over London. The telegraph, though it did not go across the Atlantic because I hadn't quite invented a 3,000 mile long submersible single um, strand of, of telegraph wire, um, but they had gotten wire to go from London all the way to China overland. So you could telegraph back and forth. In the 1880s, it was $4 in a, a word. So it was very, very expensive process, but you, but you could telegraph back and forth. And that meant that banking changed. So you didn't need to have the half a million dollars worth of bullion on hand in your office in a foreign country. You could work with with um, letters of credit and, and work with, uh, with the, um, the telegraph to get money back and forth. So on Gus's second day in London, he took a cab right through this square. He was going to visit his mentor whom his cousins had set up for him. He probably had an office on a second or a third floor um, apartment building up on Old Broadway. But when he got there, he found out that his mentor wasn't there. He was in Russia and that no job had been lined up for him, and that indeed he had the wrong clothes. Fortunately, uh, his mentor's partner took him out and he bought a top hat because all the clerks in London had top hats. And I think one of the reasons that the cousins wanted Gus to go to London was to get some town polish because the tea business was run by English people. And so, and they were really very snobby about what color, um, what kind of, um, you know, how you looked, how you presented yourself. And this, he was really astounded at how much he had to pay for his top hat, which was 15 shillings, which was about $300 in our money. And because, as I said, Gus had a uh, unpaid uh, apprenticeship and the money coming across the Atlantic was getting very difficult to get across the Atlantic and the exchange rate was horrible. So uh, Gus was just trying to live as simply as possible. And he really was in Charles Dickens's London. Um, he, when he left on the SS Arago, he had 
uh, great expectations under his arm. So he and 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 um, Dickens was a contemporary contemporary of his, and he was writing novels about how London was in real time. So that was the London that he was writing about. And indeed, there were many many aspects of Gus's experience that were like. Uh, the images in Dickens's novels and the pea soup fogs really were horrible, really were horrible. You can see over in this corner, somebody's getting pickpocketed. They needed torches to lead you through, lead the horses through. You could get trampled by horses. Sometimes the Lynx boys would lead unexpected, unsuspecting folks into a cul-de-sac and rob them. There was definitely dangers and darkness. So here is Gus's world. I do like maps. And there is the Thames running through the town. And again, so Parliament and Buckingham Palace, Hyde Park, Regent's Park, St. Paul's Cathedral, Tower of London. And this is what I wanted you to see on this map was these are the docks of London. They don't get to have docks that protrude out from the mainland. They have a tidal river to contend with. When first the, um, the port was active, boats would come in, they would raft up in the middle of the river and lighters would come out to unload the cargo. Now there was a lot of pilfering, there were difficulties with the tide coming in and out and the soft banks of the river made everything really quite, quite messy. So what the English did was they carved basins out of the side of the river, they lined them in stone and they surrounded them by warehouses that were, were fireproof, theftproof, and um, waterproof. And they used canal technology to uh, mitigate the water levels coming in. I'll show you a better picture later. And here is London Bridge. Gus, when he lives south of, uh, of the Thames, came across this bridge. Every day, every hour, there were 13,000 people crossing this bridge because in London, the population of Boston, 200,000 people walked to work every day. So he was walking to work. His first place of, of uh, that he worked was um, Bullivant and, and Wilson, and there were seven clerks there. There were two that were about Gus's age and two in their 20s and two in their 30s, and then two principals, one who didn't do much anymore and one who was very smart in the way of business and made sure nobody was sleeping on the job. It sounds a little bit like Scrooge. And Gus, at his second place of business, met James Pender Mollison, and he's this fellow right here. And then over here, there's another image of him. At Ripley's, there are two other fellows whom I like very much. They're preparing to go to China. There's one about my age who is situated about the same as I am. Indeed, not a lot of money. He's from Glasgow, Scotland, and they remained best friends for Gus's whole life. And he, they were very, they both uh, were out in Yokohama for years. And what did clerks do? Well, copying was one of the things that they needed to do. And he copied correspondence, bills of sale, and other business records. Now, this is one of Augustine Hurd's notebooks, and it is a table showing the cost of a, um, a lot of tea. Across the top, you have the price in shillings and pence. Coming down here, you have the pounds. So the math has already been done for you. And then over in this corner, there was an example of a bill of sale. And you would have the, the cost of the tea and then the freight and then the duty and then the commission. And you know, all the added costs that always turn up when you're buying something. And the other one, another thing that Gus did was he collected tea samples at the London docks. And here again to orient you is London Bridge with almost nobody on it. This is the customs house where the duty was paid for all the cargoes coming in from the British Empire and they must have made a great deal of money for the crown there. There is the Tower of London and here is St. Catherine's Docks and there is London Docks. And in the middle here, you can see all of the sailing ships that are rafted up, a couple of steamships going back and forth in 1860, a Frenchman came to visit London and he wrote a lovely essay about the waterfront. And this is a cobbled together image of what he said. 
The river is a street of ships. Their innumerable riggings stretch a vast circle of spider web all around the rim of the sky. It is one of the mighty spectacles of our planet. The docks are inhabited by three masted ships from every corner of the world. A merchant who had come to check on the arrival of spices from Java and a transshipment of ice from Norway told me that about 40,000 ships entered these docks every year, and that as a rule, there were between five and six thousands in the docks at any given moment. And here is a close-up of St. Catherine's docks. You can see the Tower of London over here. This is the smog of London back here. Um, a, a ship would come in off the river through this first gate, set of gates. It would wait in this pool as the tide would fill it up. Then they would close the gates here and open the gates there. And the boat could be, the ship could be towed around to the docks. And you can see how convenient it is. You can get the, the um, ship right near the warehouses. And these are the five, six story warehouses that are uh, surrounding the docks to make everything safe. And over, well, here there's, you can see, so, and there was a bit of urban renewal that took place to make these docks. And the docks dot all the way down the river quite, quite a ways. Um, and these, of course, will be the docks that get bombed in World War II. And then a tea clipper. We're getting close to Gus, Gus getting his samples, but I thought you might like to see the Cuddy Sark. She was one of the last tea clippers built. She was built in 1869. She's 212 feet long, 36 feet wide. She carried 3,200 square feet of sail and her fastest speed was 17.5 knots. She's now a museum ship. She's on the Thames at the Maritime Museum in London. And this is how we're getting the tea closer and closer to Gus so he can get a sample. Um, this is Augustine Hurd's house flag that would fly on the ship that was getting ready to be loaded up with tea. Uh, this is a composite picture of loading tea. Um, you have an empty hull, you fill it up with shingle at the bottom and you level it off. And there's about uh, two, 200, 150 to 200 tons of shingle. And then you level it up and then you start to put in these lovely um, tea boxes and fill them up. In between, you put batting and different materials, dunnage, to keep the load from shipping. You can have smaller boxes to fill in the interstices. Here you can see that they have come, they are loading the ship at anchor. So they are taking the, the, the uh, tea chests off one at a time coming over. They're obviously keeping records and there will be a tally man to let you know what actually got loaded. And finally, we're getting to unload the ship. Now the ship is in London. There is a warehouse in the back here. There's the mast of the ship. There's the rigging. And the, you can see the tea chests. And all of a sudden you see the scale of this business is really quite remarkable. And you needed for these heavy, heavy boxes, the English um, longshoremen invented this swan neck um, trolley and it would take the, uh, the tea boxes around and move them around. And finally, we have the, um, the, the, the top hatted clerks collecting samples of tea, which is one of the things that Gus did. What you're seeing here is the edge of the warehouse here. And then this here is the edge of the ship. And that's a funnel there, the hold of the ship where the tea is coming up. We have some Chinese sailors, some longshoremen, officers of the dock, and then the clerks coming down from the brokerage uh, businesses with their top hats. This clerk couldn't even wait for the chest to be taken off the boat. He has pried off the lid of the boat and he is taking a sample of tea and wrapping it in paper. They would take many, many samples of tea and Gus wrote about how he strode through the streets of London with a 50 pound blue sack of tea samples on his back to back to his brokerage house. Another thing that Gus did as a uh, clerk was learning to distinguish teas in their different conditions by smell, feel, appearance of the leaf when dry. Some days we smell a thousand chests of tea. And this is an image from the 20th century of tea just heaped up in, an, in a warehouse. They are blending tea, perhaps Earl Grey or English breakfast or something like that uh, by eye for the English market. 
Oops, whoops, wrong, wrong, wrong way. And no doubt you would like to know the process of tasting tea. And this is what Gus wrote. First, you have the teas you wish to taste in tin boxes, and they are placed at a regular order before the little pots and cups in which the tea is to be made. You have a pair of very delicately balanced scales in which you weigh a certain portion of the tea and put it into the cups. You have a kettle, a boiling water, and an instrument which measures about five minutes and then strikes the bell. At the moment when you pour the water upon the tea, you adjust this instrument, and when the bell strikes, the tea is ready. It is poured into cups for this purpose. In tasting it, you endeavor to find out which tea is the best, and if the best, how much it is worth. So again, you can see the silver spoon. You can see the spittoon. Here are the number of teas that they are tasting. Probably the names are over here so they can um, keep it know what they're tasting. The reason they have the tea leaves on top of the lid is the um, agony of the tea leaves. How they unfold under the boiling water is one of the things that uh, tea tasters are interested in. Uh, they had a scale very much like coffee or wine, like on 80 points, and you would measure the, the, the smell, you know, the aroma and the liquid and the taste and the tea leaves and whatever else they wanted to, to measure. So it could be compared legitimately one tea to another. And why did they need to, to know the teas? Because they were going to come up to auction. And this is the auction house. It was on Mincing Lane. So you have the customs house, the London Bridge, and here's the customs house. And then Mincing Lane is this tiny little street here that is all gone, basically. I mean, the street is there, but all the buildings from the uh, 19th century are gone. They were bombed out. Uh, but it was the, the street of tea. It's mentioned in uh, Charles Dickens's novels. Um, and then there's St. Catherine's Docks, you know, the, the same old places there. This map is from 1891, and this bridge would not be there. So Gus wrote, Mr. Ripley, this was the second place that Gus worked, has young fellows in the sales room place a valuation on all the teas that are put up at public sale. And after the teas are sold, our valuations are compared with the prices for which they are sold. And he's enabled to see how we're getting on. Now, the way the tea auction worked was during the season, the um, the tea auctioneers came up with catalogs. There would be several each week. They would list all the lots of teas that were coming up for sale. Some would have a few chests in them. Some would have many chests in them. And uh, they would distribute the catalogs and each of the brokerage houses would take them. And then they would taste all those teas. They would find get the samples of those teas and taste them and put a value on them. And then the young man would go to the, the, um, the auction and see what price they sold for and see how close they got to figuring out how much a tea was worth. If you wanted to buy tea from um, for your business, like in York or someplace outside of London, you would send your broker down to London. He would meet a London broker. And then you would taste all the teas, figure out which ones you wanted to bid on. And then the London broker would go to the auction with you and do the bidding for you because it was a very fast and furious auction with about 200 or 150 lots coming up each each hour, so it was quick. And one of the other things that Gus did was paying the duty at the customs house. I assist at making out the customs house papers to pay the duty on the tea, to go to the customs house and to pay the duty, and then to go to the different warehouses and docks where the tea lies and lodge certain papers, by which means we're enabled to get the tea delivered to our customers. Now I'm gonna talk about three Americans that came to visit Gus while he was there. And um, this is just a picture of the gates um, at, the, at the mill dock because they are so fabulous and so large and so Victorian. I just am impressed by the whole scale of this business. I have seen a good deal of Captain Hatch. I dined with him at an American boarding house where he has his quarters. The captain is disgusted with London. He would like to return home, but he has gone into the ship's chandlery business and cannot see his way clear to leaving. I think this is all because of the war. Then there is a captain and Mr. Mrs. Durham. I shall have a good opportunity of calling on Captain and Mrs. Durham because they have because his ship, the Gibraltar, will come up to Victoria docks, and I go to the docks every day. Last Sunday, I found Captain Durham and his wife living very quietly on board ship. 
They had been living for a fortnight in America Square. I do not think they liked living there, for it is one of the most miserable parts of London. Captain Durham thought he would be a month before they could get away. Now, the Durham's Gibraltar was a ship of 746 tons built by William and Avery in Frankfurt, Maine in 1854. In 1862, her home port was Liverpool, as many New England ships took on foreign nationality during the Civil War to avoid being attacked. And here you see some absolutely gorgeous clipper ships. There's a man up this mast. Here is a load of something either going up to be stored or coming down to be shipped out and the, the gates of the lock and a warehouse. I'm not sure which warehouse, which set of docks this is. And he met a young man that was a friend of his from back home named Frank Billings. And Frank Billings uh, wrote a letter and then came down from Edinburgh where his ship, the Belle Creole, had come in from the Chincha Islands off Peru with a cargo of guano fertilizer. And it turns out that guano, <laughs> mining guano was a very nasty trade. As the ships sit at anchor here, they are covered with acrid dust and then once under sail, the smell, the uh, ammonia smell must be just still overpowering coming out of the, uh, the, the hull of the ship. But they did such a good job mining that by 1874, all the deposits were gone. Uh, they used mostly Chinese coolies and, and the Chinese coolies ended up in Peru because even though they were promised a ride home to China, uh, that fell through. So how far away was China? Now, George, um, the cousin who left left uh, left Gus in England all by himself. Um, he was going to China, and it took him sixty six days from Mar Marseille. And he did the overland route to Asia, and that meant that he took the train down to Marseille. He got a steamer across the Mediterranean, then. In Egypt, they either went by camel or horse, often traveling at night to the Red Sea. They got a steamer there at Suez and came on down and went over to Bombay. And then they got another steamer and went around past Singapore to Hong Kong. Um, he arrived there in Hong Kong on the 10th of January, but they didn't receive a letter in England saying that he'd gotten there until the 28th of February. And the Clipper races, um, this is just kind of the end of an era, you know, how we're always on a cusp with the old and the new. So, so in um, 1866, which Gus was already in Japan by that time, but it was a, there was the culminating race to bring the new season's teas to London. And there were 40 sh ships involved. The Ariel and the Taiping left Fuchao on the same tide and arrived off Gravesend on the same tide within 28 minutes of each other after having traveled almost 16,000 nautical miles in 99 days and each had a payload of a million pounds of tea on board. Now it turns out that they stood off, off Gravesend, they sent up signals to get the steam tug to take them up the river and the, the, the ship with the fastest steam tug won the race. They did end up sharing the prize money because it was so close. But the steam technology was really taking the wind out of the Clippers' sails. That very same year, out of Fuchao, the Earl King, a steamer, left eight days after the Ariel in the Taiping and arrived 15 days before her. And she also had a payload of a million pounds of tea and passengers. And Gus doesn't seem to have been very excited by uh, the sailing ever in his life, even though he probably went around the world at least 20 times. But he wrote in 1863, today I have been down to Greenheath, about 20 miles down the Thames, to see a friend of mine off to China. He sails in a beautiful double screw steamer called the Far East. This is her first trip. She is going out to bring home the new season's teas and is considered one of the finest vessels of her kind afloat. My friend used to be with me at Bullivant and Wilson. He goes out as a tea taster and he's a very clever young fellow. He was a very good friend to me and when I first came over and we have been very friendly all along. I trust we shall meet someday in China. And Gus's call came shortly after that. Albert Hurt wants a young fellow in China immediately. And here's Albert, the second youngest cousin. And these are the clerks that were waiting for Gus to come. 
And I believe we have one uh, Chinese comprador in the mix here. And then before you know it, Gus's name is on the manifest of the SS Africa, which was an English mail ship going to Boston from Liverpool. You took the train from London to Liverpool and then you could not have to go uh, around the channel. And there's his name, G. Farley, 19, and he is male and he has no occupation yet. And he's a US citizen going to the US. And he spent the summer in New York and Boston. The, uh, he didn't, the, the rush for being drafted, there was, seemed to be plenty of people who still wanted to fight in the Civil War. So he didn't, didn't get drafted and didn't um, have to avoid the draft. And before you know it, he is um, on the Waterloo, leaving in on October 23rd from Boston. And he writes a nice um, diary of his of every day of his trip going along. Captain Babson is the captain of the ship. And I'll give you a few highlights of the ship. But right here is where is the first place they saw an American flag flying from a ship. And then down here, they crossed the equator and Neptune came on board. Then going here through the South Atlantic and below Africa, right here, they filled their rain barrels with water because they were not going to stop. It was 123 days nonstop. You know, I look for a nonstop flight to Europe, you know, and I'm hoping for just a few hours, but 123 days nonstop, a um, little different. But anyway, they filled the rain barrels there. This is how fast the ship made that particular day. Uh, this is called our Eastings, and the weather is very, very harsh through here. About here, Gus wrote that he didn't know the wind could blow so hard that it would practically blow your clothes off your body. And coming over here, that is the fastest 274 knots that uh, Captain Babson had ever done in his 33 years of being a a captain of a ship and then coming along here it's it's uh, christmas time and everybody's sweating up a storm they are getting the cables out to put them on the anchors because when they get up here through the islands there is danger that if the wind fails or if the wind picks up too much in the night that they would be crushed against the island so they would need to anchor if they thought that was the wise thing to do Coming along here, they come out from all those islands, make a sharp left-hand turn, come up around the Philippines and head into the China Sea to Hong Kong. And Gus wrote on January 23rd, 1865, Monday, four months ago today, we left home. We are now running up the China Sea for Hong Kong where we expect to arrive tomorrow night. I need not tell you I look forward to going ashore with a great deal of pleasure, for we know it could not be otherwise. So we had Gus, who was young and naive and alone in the big smoke. He encountered the Hoi Polloi crossing over London Bridge, clerks and fellow apprentices in the city, demeaning employers at Bullivant and Wilson and decent ones at Ripley's on Mincing Lane. He roamed the streets of London, entering the commercial auction house, the customs house and the docks, he rode to work on the Metropolitan subway line, the first of its kind. He ventured out into the countryside and he ventured, uh, visited Scotland with, with um, uh, James Mollison and he ended up going to Paris with one of his cousins. And now he was set into China for a new, new, new career, his new career. And here you see his herds right on the uh, shoulder of the hill. And there we go. And that is the end of my talk.